Jay Foreman. Hello, sir. How are you? Hello, I'm very well. I'm, I'm like that you're calling me sir already. We've only known each other for about uh, two and a half minutes. I've elevated to sir. Well, I just figured I should. Now, to date, you've done three absolutely excellent educational series, and you've also released a couple of albums, to my knowledge. Although it is a challenge to find them here in America, so do tell. What all have you done? What have I done? <laughs> what have I done? Um, I have... I, I basically have two parallel careers that don't overlap that much. Uh, one of them, I'm a musical comedian, and uh, I do gigs around the UK, mostly in London, uh, singing songs. Um, and these days, I'm doing a lot of children's gigs because uh, there's there's a market there. There's a market for children's songs, which I accidentally tapped into. Uh, more on that story later. And then my other career um, is I make videos on YouTube, um, mostly educational videos. But then just rarely, the two will cross over. I've got some clips on my YouTube channel of my live gigs. And I always imagine there are some people who they follow me for one thing and then they see that I do the other thing and then they get really confused. I think I was originally that way when I found you by means of Nerd Cubed. Yeah, can anyone explain to me what Nerd Cubed is? Because I've done some collaborations with him now. I've been on two of his videos. I still don't get it. As far as, far as I understand it, this guy called Dan, who lives somewhere he, he won't let anyone know where he lives, he plays computer games and that's it. How did he become so popular? Back in the early days of YouTube, Dan did a series called How Not to Suck in Minecraft, which I think a lot of his subscribers would argue is critically acclaimed. And so eventually after releasing a lot of videos, he's ended up doing something that he's wanted to do, liked to do, and he's, he's good at it. So it, it, that's really contributed to his success as a content creator. So I think the reason I subscribe to him is because it's comedy that at the same time is informative and is unique. And I've started, now that I'm sort of taking YouTube seriously with a lowercase s, um, I've started subscribing to channels, which is something I never used to do. And I'm starting to understand the YouTube culture with a lowercase c. And something I've noticed as well is that, you know, once you start following a channel, once you become a, a fan, there, there's a loyalty there. And even if the channel deteriorates, and even if they start putting out content that's all, you know, quite repetitive and similar and full of adverts, you still feel a connection to them because there is something quite personal about a YouTube video that you watch in your own time where you are positively encouraged to interact with them and you end up you're curious about what they have next to offer, even if it isn't necessarily very good. I would say that's absolutely true because as a content creator, you're sharing yourself with your audience and like it or not, uh, yourself is going to come through with that and they're going to get to know you in a very personal way. I used to pour scorn on people that release videos along those lines where they were like a, a good 11 minutes long and it's just, hey guys, so I've just woken up and uh, here I am going outside holding my camera. I thought, well, what was the point in those videos? But now that I'm following a few people on YouTube for a while, oh, I get it now. Like if there are people that make stuff that you like, you are curious about them and the uh, ad revenue people love it because it's all about watch time. Exactly. And I think it's amazing that we live in a world now where anybody can create anything that appeals to a demographic of 14 people, but at the same time, it's also their living. <laughs> yeah. In the days of television, when that, when that reigned supreme, uh, the key was how do you appeal to the highest number of people? And now like, in, YouTube encourages you to be as specific as possible because it is much better to find people that after a very, very specific thing that you're making, you will make a lot more people watch it by aiming, you know, accurately than by trying to appeal to everybody that says, so I do a bit of everything. I've got uh, reviews for products and I do sketches and I do... Yeah, uh, the, the TV approach to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. It's the mistake I seem to be making with my channel, what with that dual career I was just talking about. Perhaps you are, but I think eventually you'll settle into a really nice middle ground with that where you've got people subscribing for both. And on a similar note, you'll see a thread on Reddit every so often asking why somebody like Total Biscuit gets invited to more video game things and PR stunts than some of the more popular YouTubers. And the answer essentially comes down to the audience demographic, where someone who has 200,000 adult subscribers can move more copies of a video game than somebody with a trillion 11-year-olds who don't have any money to spend. Yeah, I've used a very similar reason uh, why I'm starting to do a lot more children's comedy as opposed to grown-ups comedy, um, because it works the other way around on the comedy circuit. If you do kids' gigs, you're much more likely to sell merchandise. Right, and I can see exactly how that would work out better for you. And on the subject of YouTube, I noticed that your YouTube page has a few recommended channels that uh, you may not be aware of, so I'd like to uh, cover these briefly and see exactly what you think of them. Okay. Nerdcubed. Well, Nerdcubed is probably there because Nerdcubed himself keeps on linking to my videos, and I've now collaborated with him twice, or collabed, as you meant to say, so uh, that makes sense, yes. I approve of that one. Next, Bill Wirtz. 
he is a fucking genius. Um, so I've only seen two of his videos, but I've searched and I think he's only made two videos. One of them is the entire history of Japan. The other one is the entire history of the world. And I've never seen it. Have you seen the videos? I may have fallen asleep to the very long one. Okay, wake up and watch it again. Okay. Because it's the amount of time he must have taken with that. You know, like every millisecond has got hours and hours of work gone into it with the graphics. And like, that is something to aspire to, that level of detail and care and attention. And he hasn't even enabled adverts on his channel. He's got two million views, more, like way more actually. And he's, um, what's he playing at? But yeah, he's, he's a genius. He's wonderful. I'm always curious when I see this on YouTube because there are other people that do this. And I, I kind of see it as, why don't you want to do this? Why don't you want to get money for the thing that you're already creating for free that everybody likes? I did wait a long time before finally putting adverts on my channel. I, I did think that it was, oh, people don't like, people don't want to see adverts. You know, it's really annoying and they'll think I've sold out. But I've, I've gone, I've flipped so far the other way now because I've now, I'm doing paid advertising. I've got a Patreon account. I've allowed um, ad revenue because, well, frankly, I need the money. But so more important than that, I think the culture has changed. It used to be that people were suspicious of adverts, but I think now people understand that there needs to be, you know, there has to be some kind of way of paying. You either pay for a subscription or you put up with an advert for a couple of minutes. And now that it's become part of the language of YouTube, people are fine with it. I think what people ultimately don't want in advertising, and this is my speculation, is the American TV approach to advertising, where we get eight minutes of very annoying advertisements and then three minutes of television and the cycle repeats. Yeah. Whereas my, my approach to advertising is a, a very British one. Um, so in the last video that I uploaded, um, a lot of people in the comments, and I'm so proud of them, they've noticed that there was a small black and white flashing stripey thing in the corner of the screen, which back in the 80s and 90s, you used to have on British TV to warn you the ad break is about to start. And uh, I also make sure that my adverts and my content are totally separate the screen goes black for a second between the two and never the twain shall meet. And I think as long as you do that, and as long as the adverts are really, really honestly in your face, this is an advert, people don't mind. Personally, I would agree. I think that's a phenomenally better way of doing advertisements. Now, the next person I have on my list is somebody I think you know personally, Tom Scott. Well, he, uh, he's a friend of mine from uni, and um, it's such a wonderful thing that he has now blossomed from a man not quite sure what he wanted to do for a living making hilarious videos on the side to a man who makes hilarious videos for a living. Hilarious is the wrong word. Like often they're comedic, but they're, um, yeah, uh, mm, he's very, very good. I think his content is best summed up as educational with a hint of comedy. Yeah. Now on to Vox, the news explained. I've not heard of that channel. I thought Vox was a, um, I thought they did music videos. They might do that in the UK, but at least in the US, they're a news company that owns other news companies, and they talk about everything under the sun, from fonts to polar bears to politics, which I still didn't understand even after watching some of the videos. Yeah, I, it sounds like I should be checking that channel out. Seeing as uh, three out of the four channels that have been recommended so far, I'm already a fan of. Ultimately, they do produce some clever things, and I would recommend it. Is it animations, or is it people talking, or what is it? It's a little bit of both. Okay. Now then. Jack's Films. What's that? He does comedy and other such things like songs. I could, uh, I could come up with an opinion on it, even though I've never seen it before. Jack's Films. Ah, he's a, he's a genius, that Jack. He's, uh, yeah, he's great. He's, he's a dear friend of mine. Yeah. Ah, oh, I, I really like his stuff. Besides from the close friend bit, I am inclined to believe part of that. Now, finally, Linus Tech Tips. Uh, these are getting more and more obscure as we go on. I've not a clue who or what that is, or why it's been recommended to my channel. They do comedy and educational stuff, and I think a lot of subscribers kind of follow both of you, so that's why it ends up recommended. Well, ah, that's the thing. So that list of recommendations, is that for everyone that goes to my channel, or is that just you? It's what YouTube says is related content based on subscriber activity, mostly. And does everyone see the same thing? Yes. Oh. As far as I know. So I need to check these people out. Yeah. And is there a way I can find out the opposite? Like, who are the channels that say, by the way, if you like us, you'll also like, and then they recommend my channel? Well, seeing as how I'm not a YouTube expert, I have no idea how you do a reverse search like that, but you can always go to the about page or the homepage on YouTube channels and find out what channels are considered related. Mm. The funny thing is, even the YouTube experts themselves, they don't seem to be experts either. I went along to, um, there was a competition called YouTube Next Up, where it was based in London, where um, if your channel had between 10 and 100,000 subscribers, 
uh, you were eligible for a competition where you'd win a week intense training course at YouTube school where they show you how to use cameras and lights and sound and how to plan and how to storyboard and so on. Um, and I went along there and I met all the YouTube staff and they're all really, really friendly and they're, you know, experts at what they do. But whenever we ask questions like, how does YouTube know or what counts as a view or how can you get your video promoted to the front page? And they always put their hands up and say, we don't know. It's, it's just an algorithm. And even the algorithm doesn't know. Tom Scott, by the way, speaking of him, he's already done a video that explains this really well. Uh, yeah, Tom Scott does actually have a really good video on how the algorithm works, or at least how YouTube says it doesn't work. Now then, on to one of my other questions. Regarding your educational content, are we going to see another series for you, or at least more episodes for the series you've got? Uh, well, there's two things. First of all, um, you will be seeing more of the series that I'm working on at the moment. So there's more Politics on Boring coming, uh, well, hopefully by the end of today. Uh, that's the thing I'm working on right now. And there's another episode of that coming soon in the next week or so. Um, everybody is clamoring for more Mac men. So just as soon as I can track down Mark Cooper Jones, congratulate him on his recent wedding, ask him if he's available, uh, then yes, we will uh, make more episodes of Mac men. And then beyond that, um, I'd like to come up with even more ideas. I'd like to come up with a way of making more videos more often. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty more in the pipeline. Two of your things, Unfinished London and Map Men, which I both love dearly. Thank you. Focus a little bit more on geography. Is that something you're just interested in or you went to university for it? Um, well, I'm a bit of a map geek. Um, and the reason that we made Unfinished London, which is now seven years old, there's a thought. Um, we started because me and my friend Paul, he's the guy that appears as a cameo in almost every video I've done uh, and is the technical wizard with the camera. Um, uh, he and I were looking for jobs in TV back in 2009. We thought, well, the best way to advertise our um, skills, to make a CV for ourselves, is to make a video and put it on that video sharing website, youtube.com. But um, people really liked Unfinished London, um, probably because they'd never before seen a mixture of um, earnest documentary, where it was about something quite specific and I think quite interesting. But at the same time, it was supposed to be a comedy show and it was full of really surreal humor, the sort that you wouldn't try or wouldn't be allowed to do on TV. And so people liked it and they said, make more. So we make more. And then we ended up doing another series about politics. A few more people contributed to that. And then we had Mac Men and... And now here I am still making videos and still not quite sure if I'll ever get a proper job. Well, I do hope that you'll find success with it either way, because I think it's absolutely excellent what you're trying to do here. But despite me not having been to London or knowing much about it, I think your series Unfinished London holds up very well over these years. Because when something is good, it's good. And honestly, I'd love to see other cities tackled. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll have to get a budget to travel there. Um, we, we aim for an audience comprising, it's a fictional audience that's just entirely ourselves. So people that understand all of the obscure references, that know all of the obscure parts of outer London. And we just assume if people don't get it, they won't blame us. They'll blame themselves. So, you know, we can make jokes that no one gets, you know, to a limit, obviously. But I think that is a better way of making stuff that entertains people. And I'm, I'm always baffled when people outside the UK are fans of the videos I've made because I, I try so hard to fill it with jokes that people outside the UK would never understand. There's references to TV shows and really specific things. But I, sp I suppose that might be why people like it because it's unashamedly wearing its influences and the things it's a fan of on its sleeve. Right. And despite me missing probably half the jokes you've put in it. But it's all, it's all Googleable. You know, anytime you see, you know, what the hell is that supposed to be, you Google it. Yes, well, I'm not going to pretend that I have time for that. It's just that in the end, whether you understand something or not, if content is good, it's good. It's a bit like, remember the Animaniacs? Uh, that used to be full of references that its audience didn't have a chance of getting. It was either stuff that was innuendo that would go right over the kids' heads, or it was references to Hollywood stars of the 30s and 40s. Like, what were they playing at? But that is what made me like it as a kid, that it, was, well, it wasn't talking down to me. And I thought, hey, if I watch this, that means that I'm, uh, I'm knowledgeable about Hollywood in the 30s and 40s. So you went to York. I what did, did you yes. go for? I studied uh, French and linguistics at York University. And on a repeating topic, that's how you ended up in the general vicinity and friendship of Tom Scott? Uh, well, what it... What it was, uh, we were both at uni at the same time, and uh, we knew each other through various um, societies. So uh, at the University of York, there is the Comedy Society, there's uh, the student newspapers, student radio, and Tom Scott and I, our paths would often cross. Um, I think we met a few times doing student radio, 
student TV. Um, and he was president of a very nerdy society called Dog Sock, which was a group of extreme geeks dedicated to the life and work of Douglas Adams. And so we ended up just meeting at all of these various events and became friends through that. You know, after watching some of Tom Scott's videos, that really does sound like something that he would do. Now, out of curiosity, on your Patreon, you describe yourself as making educational videos. Is that what you expected to be doing? And kind of how did you end up doing that? Uh, not at all. Um, I've never really planned ahead any further than a couple of hours in my life. And it's just, uh, it just, it seems that the videos I've ended up making, the ones that I feel most comfortable making, they fall into this category, educational videos. I suppose that's what they are. And so Patreon asked for a headline. They asked for a category to put it into. And so I said, educational videos. But if in five years I end up doing stuff that doesn't resemble educational videos at all, that, you know, there isn't even videos, that wouldn't surprise me. Okay. So can you give us kind of a personal workflow of how you produce an episode? Uh, first is the idea. Um, you, you can't do anything without an idea. So that's definitely the first thing to do. Um, uh, I will then do a script and I almost always have someone to help me with that because, um, I don't have the motivation to sit and write. I need someone else in the room that I can bounce ideas off. And, um, so we'll end up with a script that will change and change and change many times. We'll then have a storyboard, an audio demo where we basically put it on the timeline with all the music and sound effects and voiceover already there. And then the final stage that we do is actually going out and filming. So we have very few deleted scenes because the bit where we're checking that it works and checking that the pacing is okay is in the storyboard stage. And the, the, the amazing thing about editing on the kind of software that we all use nowadays, like, well, I use Final Cut because my computer is very old. Um, you can check the pacing as you go along. And what I always do is do an audio demo first where we you can basically make a radio version of the finished product, check that works, then go out and film it and then put everything in place, spend forever just like doing finishing touches and extra bits that no one's going to notice and then upload. That's that's how it's done. But one rule that I do have is it's very, very, very rare that I will change a joke after having written it. I mean, I, I can add graphics and I can, you know, turn the volume of something up and down. I'm always happy to make little changes like that. However, if I come up with a joke very early on in the writing stage, I'm quite hell-bent on keeping it as it is because it is so tempting when you get so close to a project and you get so bored of you know hearing your voice over and over again of changing it to make yourself laugh. And then you have to remember that it, on it was only funny when it made sense, which was in its original form. If something changes a bit too much, it won't make sense anymore. And so that's something I'm sort of hell-bent on doing is having a clear vision right from the start how it should look at the end and then and try and stick to it it's surprisingly hard to do absolutely i think it is a good way of attacking something but at the same time you can get into a perfectionist attitude that can become your downfall yeah well interestingly my brother who you might know is the musician beardy man and he works in a very different way from me so he um whenever he creates a piece of music he'll start not having a clue how it's going to end up and then he'll gradually add layers and then he'll ad lib uh, and improvise bits of music and bits of words. And then the end product will be something that he never saw coming. It's a very different way of working, but it's fascinating. That reminds me of one of the stories I heard about Mythbusters, which is why the show eventually quit. Uh, the two main hosts, Adam and Jamie, had very different styles for planning and building and creating. And they just did not like working with each other in the end. On the music you've written, I'm inclined to describe you as a musical genius, since Aww, everything I've ever seen you do is delightfully clever. And I'm non-specifically referring to things such as bim 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 and singing one syllable out of sync. Thus, I'm curious, where has music started for you? I've been playing the guitar since I was about seven years old, and um, I was that who brought guitars to parties. I've always, always played guitar and enjoyed playing in public, and um, when I was at uni, um, I played funny songs at the open mic nights. And that became a, a sort of job. So your children-focused content just kind of fell into place then? Yeah, well, the, the reason I do the singing to children, um, so uh, for the last 10 years I've been attending the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is a huge, uh, very important comedy festival in the UK. And for years I had a show there. And there was one time um, audiences came to my show that happened to be, right, so I had my show at 8 p.m., but it was in the tent that is usually, for the rest of the day, used for kids' shows. And people came along not thinking it was a kid's show, but thinking it looked a lot like one. And then loads of parents said to me at the end, you know, it's such a shame that you got so much swearing in your songs, because if you didn't have swearing, do you realize you've actually got a potentially really good kid's show on your hands? And I thought, 
all right, good idea. So I then went back to the fringe the next year with an almost identical show, but with the swearing taken out, a couple of new songs specifically written for kids thrown in, and the title changed, and it was now called Jay Foreman's Disgusting Songs for Revolting Children. And that ended up being the best-selling show I've ever done. So I went back the year after with another kids' show, and I seem now to be doing probably more children's gigs than grown-ups' gigs. That's never something I intended to do, but it, it's paying the bills. Well, I mean, if it's worked out in the past, Reed, that's absolutely excellent. I really hope it continues to. So what artists have been influential to you in your own writing? Musically, um, I'm going through yet another um, Beatles uh, fandom stage at the moment. I've, they're a huge, huge influence musically. Um, I think it's important to be influenced by something that's not comedy when you're creating comedy. Otherwise, it won't sound interesting. Uh, that said, I think my favorite musical comedians are the likes of Tim Minchin, Bill Bailey, Flight of the Concords, because what they've all got in common is the, the music is so good and so clever that it would merit a re-listen even without the funny lyrics. No, absolutely. I've ended up with some of their riffs caught in my head for days on end. Yeah. Also, I'm, I'm now getting a lot into uh, Jake Thackeray. And interestingly, he is someone that I hadn't heard of before I started. But a lot of people, especially old people that came to my gigs, they'd say, oh, uh, have you heard of Jake Thackeray? You remind me of Jake Thackeray. So I looked him up and, uh, oh, I've never heard of him. But yeah, this guy's really good. And he, he reminds me of like me, but if I was like way, way better. Maybe so. But he didn't write Bim Bim Bim, did he? I understand that you've been a part of a number of different productions, uh, some of the BBC, some otherwise. What's been your favorite one to be a part of? Um, the most fun I had doing um, uh, a, a comedy thing, outing, was when I was the support act on Dave Gorman's UK tour. So Dave Gorman is a big comedian. He had a tour of the UK in uh, 2011, 2012, and I was the support act. And the best thing about that was I got to um, play all of these fantastic venues, some of them enormous, uh, night after night. And um, that was one of the happiest times of my um, comedy career, I would say. Wow, that's pretty amazing. More specifically, though, have you had any moments? Oh, yeah, loads, loads. Okay, tell me your favorite ones, starting from your birth. <laughs> no, but have there actually been anything that has led you to do what you're doing now? Well, again, as I've never really taken any conscious decision what sort of thing should I do next. Like, everything I've ever done, I've, I've fallen into. And, you know, for example, the fact that I'm doing educational videos now, that's, that's a coincidence because... I did two videos in a row that had an educational bent to it, and, and that's now become what I do. But it's never something I intended, really. I think I've answered a different question there. Yeah, not really sure how you did that. Um, your website, though, jforman.co.uk, are you aware that it shows you page on Assetto Corsa Sprint Racing? Yeah, if you put the Ws in, then my website works fine. If you miss the Ws out, then it goes to a different J Foreman, and I don't quite know what to do about that. You could go back and fix the links in your video, but nah, who's going to do that? Yeah. I mean, who uses websites anymore anyway? It's a web 2.0. It's all YouTube and whatnot, social media. Because my, my website is so disastrously out of date. It doesn't mention politics on Boring at all. Uh, it's still advertising a show on the South Bank in London that um, was about two years ago. You know, you can still buy tickets for it, but you've also, you also need a time machine. Ah, oh, I'm going to be late for that. Well, where can people find you on the interwebs? You can go to www, and you've got to include those w's, uh, .jforman.co.uk. Um, you can also go to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash jforman. I'm on Twitter, at jforman. Google it and you'll find it. Right. Well, jforman, thank you very much for being on the podcast and sharing your time with us. Have a good one. Bye-bye.